Hello and welcome to a special edition of Brick Clips. Boy, do we have a story for you tonight. So many men and women have given their lives to the brick industry. So many of them have so many wonderful stories to tell that many times go unnoticed. We've started what we call the Brickman's Hall of Fame, where we pick four to five people every year from all parts and fields of the industry, whether it's manufacturing or sales, or distributor ownership that we will induct yearly into the Brickman's Hall of Fame to tell their story, share their thoughts and loves and things that they see that it might be changes or interesting that we hope that you will find also interesting. We hope you enjoy. I did a little bit of everything uh, starting out. Uh, you know, I jig brick, I hack brick, worked all over the plant. Uh, I went through Texas A&M through the School of Architecture and Construction. It was the first time I sold a million brick when I actually wrote an order that had a million brick on oh, it. Oh wow! That was that was a, a real a real high. Their type of mining was totally different than Belden. Belden's was pretty unique because the, the raw material came out of uh, the same vein shale, red burning shale, and uh, buff burning fire clay come out of the same, uh, the same pit. So. Tunnel kills, a lot more efficient. Uh, your handling was different because periodic kills is all hand fed in there. You hand load them and stuff and very labor intensive to do that versus now you've got your big dinosaurs loading your cars and stuff and the human hand doesn't hardly touch them. Our second interview tonight is a man I've known for many, many years, Ray Staub. Please join the Brick Clips team as we go interview Ray and give him his award at his house in Illinois. Well, we're off to see Ray Staub today, and uh, we're going to go to Ray's house, hopefully see his wonderful wife, Susan. She's there today. But I go way back with Ray in the industry. In fact, uh, I'm not quite sure how many years Ray's been in the business, I'll have to ask him that question, but um, I truly can call Ray Staub a friend, a mentor. He, uh, I used to work for Ray Staub many years ago at Glengarry when, when Ray was vice president of Glengarry. I was actually a sales rep, a district sales manager, and then a regional sales manager under Ray. Ray promoted me to be over the Ohio region. Um, regional sales manager at Iberia, and then I shared the Caledonia plant with, with Hogan back in those years. But uh, Ray's been, been a big part of my life, meant a lot to me. So it'll be kind of fun to see Ray and Ray again and uh, talk to him a little about. We're going to give him an award today. And uh, it's something that uh, we've come up with as a Brickman's Hall of Fame. And we thought it'd be cute as uh, we look for people that are interesting in the industry and that have been around for a while, well embedded in the brick industry and uh, very knowledgeable. And Ray has traveled the country. Uh, Ray has, has worked for several brick companies. Um, I'll let him tell more of his story of his life, but back in the Belden days and the Glengarry days, I'm sure you have some interesting stories to share with us. I know Ray's a great golfer. I'm going to try to ask him today what his handicap is, but uh, Ray's an awesome guy, and like I said, he's been around for many, many years, and uh, we look forward to seeing him today. Well, welcome to another version of Brick Clips, and we just want to thank you for taking time to be with us again today. I've got a special treat for you. I'm with a, a dear friend, Ray Staub. He's also been a mentor for me. Uh, I've worked for Ray for many years, and uh, part of the reason why I'm here today, I can give total credit to Ray Staub. So, Ray, thank you for being with us with Brick Clips. We're going to take Ray back down memory lane a little bit. And uh, Ray, how many years have you been in the brick industry? Sixty, Donnie. 60 years. That is, that is just tremendous. Um, Ray, let's take us back to the beginning of time when you first got involved in the brick industry or what got you in the brick industry. Well, I was a 15-year-old junior in high school and um, I was trying to make the football team. I needed a football scholarship, athletic scholarship, and um, 
there was a friend of mine that worked for the Belden Brick Company at that time, and uh, Belden Brick Company was on Moore Road in Canton, Ohio, and um, I went down and asked the superintendent for a job, and he said, you're too young, Sonny, and you're too small. Um, come back when you get a little bit older. And uh, like I said, I was 15 then, but back in those years, why well, I was right after the war, 1948, and um, bodies were hard to find. So he reluctantly called me back, and um, I worked my junior year in uh, high school and my senior year. And in those years, why you could work all the hours that you wanted to. I would play a football game on Friday night and go to the brick plant on Saturday morning and work eight, ten hours and do the same thing on Sunday. And when basketball season was in, play, play basketball on Friday night and go to work at the brick plant on Saturdays and Sundays. So I did that um, all during my um, junior and senior year. Uh, managed to get a very small scholarship to a school. And, um, but I was drafted. I um, ended up going in the service in uh, 1951 and come out in 53 and uh, uh, went back to work for Belden at that time. And uh, as the years progressed, well, I even, I, I wrote to the superintendent when I was in the service, told him I was not going to come back because um, it was tough work. It was hard work. And um, I was uh, interested in getting to other things. and. He wrote and told me he wanted me to come back, that I had a future in the brick business, so I did. And um, as it grew along, I kept getting promoted and promoted from one job to the next job. And finally, I was, uh, well, I started out being a kill foreman, and then I became yard foreman, and then I became assistant to the superintendent. And, um, and then in 1959, uh, one of the officers in the company asked me if I wanted to get into sales. And uh, so I went into sales in 1959 and um, continued to work uh, for uh, Belden in the sales promotion, in the sales promoting, promoting brick in Northeast Ohio. And um, then I started traveling more extensively for them. And uh, I was made a regional sales manager and uh, then in 1980, I was made vice president and sales manager, national sales manager. And um, then I left them in 1988 and um, ended up going to uh, Sioux City Brick as um, vice president of sales. Mm. And I stayed there for five years. And um, 1993, I ended up going to Glen Gary in the same national sales manager, vice president, and the same role. And um, I stayed uh, with Glen Gary for 15 years and then became a consultant in uh, 2007. And um, I am consulting today for the Brampton Brick Company uh, out of Brampton, Ontario, Canada. And um, they are building a new plant in southern Indiana. Uh, and a um, little town called Farmersburg and um, very anxious about that because I came out of production. I was in production 11 years before I got into sales and um, I'm very anxious about this opportunity to, uh, to be with them and also be part of this Greenfield site, this new nice. plant. Now, now let's go back a little bit. When you were playing football, what is um, what position you playing football? Believe it or not, I was a linebacker. <laughs> nice. Work at the plant when you were between basketball and football. What was the position the plant that you actually did? Well, um, I was sort of the handy guy, but I worked a lot of piecework. I worked piecework in the manufacturing. They called them hackers back then, and I also worked piecework in in the kills and um, that, that's when we were drawing brick. These were uh, periodic kills that were coal fired and uh, t as you know today they're gas fired but they've done away with that type of kill. But um, uh, drove a lift truck, uh, just, just did everything and anything you could think about in a brick plant. 
Well, what's neat is the, the mix. Uh, we can go so many different places, but let's go back to um, on your time with Belden, which was really the longest, 15 with Glengarry, right? But even Belden was even a longer span. Belden was 40 years. Oh my, 40 years. Do you, what's a great Belden story? Is there a cute Belden story? I mean, you and I have known a lot of the Beldens over the years, but is there, think back, um, um, uh, something that's a, a cool experience you had in Belden that would be something you want to share with the Beldens? Well, I think that um, I was 15 years old at the time, and uh, one time the founder of the company, P.B. Belden Sr., came into the manufacturing area, and uh, I was hacking brick at that time, and he reached down and picked the brick off the line, turned it over, and the trademark was not on the back of it. And he immediately told the foreman to close the line down. Uh, Belden has is one of those companies, one of those unique companies that put the trademark. It said Belden Brick Company, Canton, Ohio, and the run number was on the back of the brick, and that was very significant for matching jobs, and it helped the uh, it helped the distributors with uh, with their inventory control and what they could put on t different jobs, what colors that they could put on jobs, and things like that. And um, I was very impressed with that because um, we had to scrap all the brick that did not have the trademark mm. on it. We had to go back into the dryers. It was probably forty, fifty thousand brick. Oh wow! Um, so that was that impressed me a great deal. And uh, he said at the time that uh, if it didn't say Belden on the back, he didn't want the brick made. <laughs> so I was very impressed with that as as an owner. He that was very impressive to me. So. I, I've always kind of tried to study brick, and I was getting the the tag Brickman years back. Uh, to be able to go to almost any job to tell you at least an idea where what manufacturer it came from or where it came from and all those things. And I was at a job with an architect one time and he was arguing with me how I knew that it was a Belden brick. Right. And I took him back and I said, well, they put a brick in backwards and they see the name Belden on mm -hmm. the back of the brick. And right. can't argue with that when right. they did that. So When they put the run number on there, that also, they had a map that they used in their pits so they could find that run number and go back to the area on the map that was in their pits so they knew where they were getting their raw material from wow. at that particular time. And that was significant when you came in to match jobs. Hmm. So. That's amazing. What they've done over the years matching brick has just been incredible. Yes. Incredible no to what question I can say. About it. How about going to Sioux City Brick now? What's uh, a cool story for Sioux City Brick? Sioux City, I was there for five years and that was a stepping stone for me. Um, because that was a little bit different. Um, I got a lot closer to the distributorship because they sold, they sold brick in three markets direct at that particular time. So they had their own distributor outlet with their own salesmen and people like that. So that was, that was kind of refreshing because it gave me a look at the, uh, the distribution end of the brick business, not just the manufacturing end of it. A different mix than the Belden, different distributors than what Belden was selling to? Different mix, different uh, different customer base because of where they were located in Sioux City, Iowa. And um, yeah, definitely different uh, different customer base. Also, you don't know, noted is the raw materials out that was different. So they had a lot of variety of different colors. Yes, than what they the Belden did. Made at and time their, type of, uh, their type of mining was totally different than Belden. Belden's was pretty unique because the, the raw material come out of uh, the same vein. Shale, red burning shale and uh, buff burning fire clay come out of the same, uh, the same pit, so. If you think of um, um, the Glengarry stories, uh, you know, 15 years, I was, I was part of you those 15 years. So I yes. got to know you that, that whole time. Um, there's a tremendous amount of stories that we can tell, but um, a gentleman you and I got to, uh, to know real well and, and uh, think highly well it was, was Philip Mingle. Do you have a, a cool Philip Mingle story you'd like to share? Philip Mingle hired me from Sioux City when I was 61 years old. And um, he took a chance. Uh, I had a lot of experience at that time, 45 years experience. Um, but um, I guess the one story that I can think about at that time, um, 
Glengarry was uh, owned by Ipstock Johnson, mm -hmm. and Ipstock Johnson was British. And um, I interviewed with him um, for a total of 11 hours. The first interview took place in a bar. Um, we went four hours <laughs> with no dinner. And the next interview, we stay, were staying at the same hotel. The next uh, interview was two hours for breakfast. Mm. So that made six hours. And the third interview uh, was at his, his apartment in New York City, and we went five hours. So three different, uh, three different locations, 11 hours of interviews. And I guess he had to be very careful um, you know, the one thing he asked me was if I was going to retire at 65, and I told him no, and, and um, so anyway, we came to an agreement. And as I said, he took a risk because of my age, um, but obviously that turned out to be no barrier. And um, he reported to his boss uh, in London that um, he had hired an individual, and he was going on to ask him about my experience and things like that. And uh, so he was talking and he said, well, how old is this chap? And uh, he said, 61. And there was complete silence on the phone. And um, finally he said, well, Philip, I guess you know what you're doing. Because, you know, most of the time uh, in Europe, people retire at 60 and I was not interested in retiring. And Glengarry was a tremendous challenge, tremendous challenge, because they had come through some very tough years, uh, 90, 91, 92. Uh, I was hired in June of 93, and this, uh, th these were tough years in the brick business. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of plants were not running, and um, Glengarry was an enormous challenge for me. Um, and um, Glengarry made me a lot better manager than what I ever thought I could be um, because of all the challenges in sales and, uh, and marketing and, and manufacturing. So Glengarry was, uh, was a, r a real challenge for me. Could you, could you pinpoint a couple of specific areas of the challenges that you had to address? in uh, the, that run with Glengarry, that 15 years, or your first really four or five years just getting uh, things kicked off? Well, probably the most difficult thing was that uh, uh, we had to cut the cloth to fit the man. Um, they, uh, they had too many people, mm. too many offices that were not productive, and um, Philip and I talked about that, and I said to him that, uh, you know, that we've got too many people, uh, too many offices, we don't need them, they're not productive, and um, he wanted to know how fast I could do this. And um, I said, it's going to take at least six months. He said, no, we have to have it done in 60 days. And mm. I said, Philip, it just can't be done. I can't get around to, um, to uh, analyze all these locations. And, uh, and, make, uh, and make a good decision for the company. So uh, we did it in six months, and as it turned out, it was the right thing to do. I did not have that experience, though, but I did know what it took to have how many street people you needed to sell brick in markets, and um, obviously uh, they had too many people. Mm. So um, we reduced the staff, and. Um, like I said, we cut the cloth to fit the man, and uh, within six months, um, the company broke even, and uh, from that time on, we started making money. Wow. How about um, with plant-related decisions? I mean, you were involved not just in the sales part of it, but overseeing the production side, dealing with the plants. Um, it, because I traveled with the president of the company, um, Philip, the, the chief financial officer, um, uh, the vice president of manufacturing, we all traveled together. And consequently, um, you learned a lot from traveling with, uh, with the vice president of manufacturing, and you learned a lot about the business side of the business with, uh, with the chief financial officer. Um, 
So I learned an awful lot about the, um, the entire uh, manufacturing, sales, marketing, finance. Um, I, ent I learned a lot about the entire package. And in some of my previous jobs, I didn't quite have that much um, uh, participation in that end of the, uh, the, the business. Did you, what do you see today, I guess, um, and just kicking off from that, what are the manufacturers going to have to deal with today that they, so much different market than it was back then? Well, Donnie, it's, it, it's all about man hours per thousand. Um, you've seen this growing uh, over the last 30 years where you must eliminate the man hours per thousand in order to make your brick as cheap as you possibly can. And um, ultimately this is passed on to the consumer. But um, uh, I see this, I, there's, there's some great things been done in uh, manufacturing and um, uh, eliminating people. Um, where example, um, you may have, might have a hundred million brick company that takes 90 people uh, going back uh, 15 years ago. Today, uh, the new Brampton facility uh, is going to manufacture a hundred million brick with approximately 30 people. So um, that's what's happening in the industry. You see that. Um, it's not only with Brampton, it's with all manufacturers. But, um, but well, that's just really maintenance people, right? Not people that are running the plant and right. packing the stuff. Right. And it's just that they have done so many things. The um, people like Sarik and who is the uh, one of the largest kill builders mm -hmm. in the world, and they've come up with innovations. Example: the Brampton plant is the um, uh, today, maybe not tomorrow, but today, they have um, the largest kill in North America. Mm. And um, each kill car holds 18,000 brick. Oh, that's incredible. So it's incredible when you think back uh, when I started with Bell and the kill car held 3,500 brick. Yeah, yeah. See? So um, there's a lot of things that have changed, but the good thing is that the, uh, the brick industry is, is pushing forward. They've got a lot of things that, uh, on the burner um, that, um, that are going to help us make better products at, uh, at a cheaper cost. Well, you have, you have, you look at the, we talk about the man hours, and one of the coolest things as far as getting, you make more brick and with less people, or make more brick even faster. What's happened now is the industry has a huge surplus of brick. Some of the yards have huge amounts of brick on the yards that they had, didn't have in the past, but they have. And you have, as you mentioned, new plants coming up. How is the industry gonna deal with that now, even though they're trying to keep their man hours down, now they're cutting back production, maybe they're shutting kilns down, they're doing different things, but the surplus, I don't know that we'll see a change of that usage of brick be even more in the next at least five to ten years to come. At least I don't see that happening. Well, that's, uh, and, and I don't disagree with that, uh, but um, that's what the brick industry is working very hard at, uh, market area one, market area two, to try to get the brick usage factor greater than what it is today. Um, you know, in the South, in the Carolinas, in Texas particularly, the brick usage factor is much greater mm -hmm. as what it is in the Midwest and the, and the, uh, in the Northeast. And that is something that we're going to have, as an industry, we're going to have to work very hard at getting the brick usage factor up. Uh, one of the great parts of North America is Canada. Canada's brick usage factor is just tremendous compared to what we have and what we've experienced here. But you're right, um, we're overproduced today um, and uh, we're going to have to find a way to somehow sell nine, million, nine billion brick uh, in the U.S. and um, we haven't found that, the answer to that yet. You know, over the years I've noticed at times where you know, the dealers can control how much bricks move from the manufacturers by what they stock in the yards. Traveling, what I've done the last couple of years, it's amazing to see that they've got smarter as far as getting their inventory down, you know, which they're 
turning that into cash versus being bricks into their yard. But now they're using the manufacturers more now than ever as the stocking facility. Now there might not be as many choices for the consumer as far as when they show up at a dealer's yard, but the manufacturer either has it or they don't, or they will make it later on. But now that extra surplus that could have been sitting in the brickyards are now at the brick plants that they see today. That's very true. And of course, what's compounded that is um, the economy that we're in, the fuel cost, the trucking rates have all increased. We've had, we've talked to truckers that in, in, in a year's period of time, their rates have gone up 60, 70 percent. Mm. And I think you're going to see uh, more distributors depend on the manufacturers to be their stocking yard rather than um, have them shipped to the yard in the rehandling cost of putting those, taking the brick out of the yard, putting them to the job. I think we're going to see more of direct uh, job shipments than what we have to yards. I think the other thing too, Donnie, that's happening, we're starting to see this, brick plants are going to be more regional than what they have been in the past. Mm -hmm. Uh, now, of course, you always have unique uh, manufacturers um, like the Endicotts and the Beldons that are predominantly architecturally oriented. Their products may travel further, but the residential products, I think you're going to see become more regional. Hmm. In the old days um, used to be uh, what they used to call the 50-mile radius mode where the brick plants or even block plants today, but I even see block plants exceeding that, but you're right, that could be easily backing up, back us up up. Until we, until we get a handle on the price of oil, which ultimately affects fuel and trucking rates and things like that, I think you're going to, if we ever get back to where we were four or five years ago, um, if that ever happens, then maybe brick plants will continue to ship long distances, but I think it's going to be more regional, at least until we get through this, um, this economy. That um, Main Street Cosmetics, as you know, is just a small company, but this year alone, uh, we've spent about $23,000 more in just gas than we did last year. And we ran our trucks more efficiently as far as the travel where to and from. So it's amazing impact. Our, and we didn't raise prices, but that impacted our bottom line immediately for us, you know, yes. just a small company. So. We're all going to have to find ways to operate uh, less expensive than what we have in the past. I just can't imagine what it's done to some of the bigger companies that what it's done as that goes. Um, how about um, the Brampton plant? What kind of sizes is this going to make, the new one? The Brampton plant is going to make a, um, a modular size, a queen size, an engineer size. Um, Any king size at all? There's no king size made, but they make what they call a Premier Plus. Premier Plus is equivalent to 3.9 BE in the wall. And um, it's, it's smaller than a utility, but larger than a king. Okay. And uh, they're also going to make uh, utility sizes there. So there's going to be five sizes made at that, nice. at that particular plant. Um, it's a wonderful location. The raw material is right across the street from the plant. I mean, it's, uh, the raw material starts less than 100 yards from the plant. Hmm. So uh, it's a wonderful site, and uh, the raw material lies, uh, lies uh, 65 feet under 20 feet of overburden. Wow. So um, it's very unique, and it's going to be a wonderful manufacturing facility. And... Um, there's other plants right in the area. Boral has a plant about 12 miles away. General Shale has one about 45 miles away. And it's so close. Wow. So southern Indiana is going to become a, <laughs> a huge manufacturing state. That's incredible. Um, how about a non-brick related? Uh, what's other things that you like to do or a cute story you might want to share with us that's non-brick related or with brick companies? Well, I play, I play a lot of golf. And um, is there a handicap with us today? Um, no handicap, but uh, <laughs> I'm. Uh, you know they'll use it. They'll use this. Anybody hears this, yeah. what that is from here on. That's the reason I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> uh, I'm 77, and I've shot my age since I've been 72 numerous times. Wow, that's amazing. So. Um, 
Bob and I were, uh, we went and took a lesson, and Bob's just starting golf for the first time, but we really wanted to come over and play golf with you, but I said, I, I got to get better before I play with Ray. And we went on a two-week spur that actually chipped one in from 40 yards out. Did and, you really? Uh, I got down to below 110, and Bob's like, wow, you're pretty good. And then we, two weeks later, I go out, and I shoot a 138, and I'm as horrible as ever, and I thought, we're not ready for Ray yet. I got, we got to get better, so <laughs> got to keep well, it through. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I had another hole in one. It's my third one, and um, yesterday I shot 72. So I'm playing. You good. had three hole in ones. I've had three. Oh, yeah. that's just. Fantastic. But I've had something more rare than that. I've had uh, a double eagle. That's where you hit a drive and the, you know, on a par five, and then it goes into the hole. That is amazing. So, yeah. Um, how about uh, if you had to give an advice to somebody young coming into uh, especially brick sales today, what would you give them? What advice would you give someone coming to the brick business today um, compared to maybe different to what you had been 20 years ago, or would that be the same? I think it has to be the same. I, I don't know. There's wonderful opportunities for people in the brick business, uh, particularly people who are willing to work hard and are enthusiastic. You know, you have to love what you do. If you don't love what you do, you better find something that you do love and do that. Um, That's right. Because um, uh, most people in the brick industry don't know what 40-hour weeks are. Mm -hmm. 50 and 60-hour weeks required, particularly if you're in the sales or the manufacturing end of it. It's long hours in this business. It's hard work, and uh, it's very rewarding. But by the same token, um, I think it all starts with um, uh, your enthusiasm, your heart for the industry, and the fact that you want to be successful. Yeah, it's funny that uh, you just, there's no way you can do it on a 40 hour or less week no. like someone wants to do or four 10 hour days no. they put together, is it? No, it's much, much more difficult than that. Hmm. So, Ray, thank you very, very much for spending time with us today and being with us. Donnie, you're very, very welcome. Thank you for coming. Another little special treat, uh, treat for you is that uh, one of the things Masonry Cosmetics has done, again, trying to make a little difference, a fun difference in the industry, and we've come up with a way to um, kind of give back a little bit. And uh, we've gone out uh, and looked for special, interesting people of the industry, somebody that's uh, been a great part of the industry, is well-established, industry very knowledgeable, information that uh, we like to capture on camera and share. And we've had that interview earlier with Ray, and uh, we want to give Ray a little token because every year, and we're kicking this off at the Carolina Forum every year uh, out of our hospitality suite is picking four to five special people in the brick industry today. And one of them is uh, Ray Staub, and we are welcoming Ray to the Brickman's Hall of Fame. So Ray, we want to give you a little token and appreciation. And out of 2008, you are in the, one of the first uh, and second group uh, Brickman's Hall of Fame candidate. Thank you, Donnie. I appreciate this award very much. Awesome. Back at...